and welcome back to this last session of day two of Learning Technology Autumn Forum. I will be your chair for this session. And for those of you who've been tuned in since the beginning, you will remember that we started on Tuesday morning with very high level view of AI and its influence on the learning tech landscape. So I'm um, taking this opportunity to invite you all to introduce yourself, where you are in the world. I think it's wonderful that you are such a multicultural audience. You're actually going to have a very multicultural panel today. Um, and, um, and tell us as well what have really stick with you uh, since Tuesday. Uh, key information, key sessions, uh, maybe a nugget, something that you, uh, you really want um, to build upon on your skills. Um, so AI has really been dominating uh, the landscape of the, 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 the seminar. And I guess the question we're all asking ourselves, especially with so limited time in our hands to dig into so, such a wide topic, is what are we going to do to leverage the generative um, element of AI? And as we all know, one of the key um, elements of our learning mix in the corporate it remain um, uh, e-learning. It has a core of most organization learning strategies. And today, I am delighted uh, to welcome Sven Becker and his colleague Amanda from IMC, who are going to explain the big changes when it comes to e-learning from inception of a program to its delivery. And they're also going to show us how it can be done well. Sven is an expert in user design in the context of learning, and Amanda is a product evangelist specializing in technology solutions. Last point before we get started. Uh, please, can I encourage you to use the chat? Absolutely. But if you've got questions to the speakers, please uh, use the question tabs. A little bit easier for me, but also uh, you can all write the questions so I can see which one you really want us to address. And I will bring it first uh, during the Q&A. And without further ado, I would like to turn over to Sven. Welcome. Many Sven. thanks. Yeah, many, many thanks. It's great to, to speak here today to you. And yeah. Let us rewrite the way we learn. This is what we all want to look today on. Um, so I think we can directly jump in and I will have some uh, presentation there. And later, uh, Gallup already said, uh, we want to make it a little bit more hands-on. So that means that uh, my colleague and Amanda would show you um, a solution from, from IMC, which we have developed based on the idea where we are or all heading into it. Uh, but yeah, let me start. Fast and better, transforming your e-learning uh, creation strategy. Um, so once again, hi from my side. Um, Gail have already told you I I'm, I'm have a, a learning design background and especially um, what for me is important also a UX design background. So I'm, I'm looking always into new opportunities, how we can improve um, the steps we have with our learners. Perhaps learning is not the right way. Sometimes you have things that have to be trained or sometimes you have to change processes. This is something where we are looking into. <laughs> looking into sorry i have to jump back on too fast <laughs> i want to show you one video about imc that you get a little bit of glimpse on uh, what we are doing um, and then we directly jump into the
So what we're seeing here and what we have seen in the video IMC was established 25 years ago. We're working globally. Um, so that means um, our headquarters is in Germany, but we also have our offices in the US and London and Australia and so on. Um, and we are full service provider. So that means we uh, provide a learning management system. Um, we provide also bespoke content. So we're an agency. Um, and at the end, and this is uh, what we are looking today on, um, we are also offering authoring solutions where we enable our customers to produce uh, content, content strategies on their own. Here you see the full portfolio, but again, it's not totally about IMC today. It's more about our topic. Um, so I directly jump in and give you a brief history um, and Perhaps also a little bit uh, a personal uh, feeling I have uh, I have seen in the, in the in the couple of years I'm working in this field. So I started um, in the learning field 2007. Um, and when we're looking at the history, it's important to understand where the web technologies are heading into. Why it is uh, important, especially when I'm looking into into my field. Um, when I was not at IMC, I was I was a web developer and looking into your user experience design and your UA, um, UX design um, in the in the web technology. And it's what is interesting for me, and it's hard to say when I jump into the e-learning field, I'm wondering why the e-learning field is 10 years beyond the web technology market. So we the e-learning market have have talked a lot about yeah, let me say processes, eddy modules, um, how instructional design uh, is working. That's right and that's good, but we don't have used at this time uh, newer web technology. So, and this is also something what we have recognized, especially when I have recognized when I started in, uh, in IMC, um, that the web 2.0, the, the right thing was not bringing to the user. This was an interesting point for me because the, 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 the user as a, as a part of our training processes, um, as a producer at the end, um, is something what is deeply involved in web technologies and from the, from the DNA from web. And now we're talking about the web 3.0. This is a totally different direction where we go into decentralizations. Um, and this is something what will affect us here in the e-learning market extremely strong in the next couple of years. Um, and yeah, the idea is now when we're looking from web 2.0 into web 3.0, where we are heading into it. The past was a little bit more the experience economy. That means we, we have looked um, as, as a company when we're looking, for example, in the marketing field, how we can create the greatest experience around the user, how we help the user to consume more, um, how we push user to, to use products or to learn something. That's the idea where learning experience is coming from. But now there is a, a fast shift and it is faster than, than, we, than we can see and then we can really feel. It is the creator community. And this is something what we have to bring in our strategies also. Because with the creator community, you have one thing. This is special. The people are interested in their, in their content. They want to create content. And they want to go the path to be able to they enable themselves to create content. And this is something um, what I want to reflect here. And also as IMC, we have reflected this um, in the couple of years, in the last couple of years. But let me start um, a little bit from the history side. Um, I think who is a little bit longer in the market knows this, that in, in a, I think in 1990s already, we have started with, uh, with video cassettes or so, uh, VHS, uh, you can, you can buy them and you make, make some, there were training available already. Then the, the first CBTs, the computer-based trainings comes on with CD-ROMs and such things. First WBT projects, funny IMC's first project was a um, was a WBT a web based training for Mercedes Benz to explain to people what is a browser. That's that's really a great story. Um, but everything was developed um, with a high effort. You need highly specialized people um, to create such such training products. And then the the, the market starts already with uh, some some ideas of structuring the, the the production line. So there was instructional designer, there's a motion designer, there's a visual designer, perhaps there, there, there was an audio designer and so on. 
Um, and then with the first crisis coming up, especially the financial crisis, um, there was a rising of uh, new uh, technologies and this was authoring solutions, especially the term, it's, it's interesting when we're looking into today, the term rapid authoring came up. Um, so the first tools were available where you have to, the possibility to only to convert at the end PowerPoint into, into some e-learning uh, modules, into score modules or something else. So the first tools have the idea um, to make it easier and faster so that we don't need the agencies anymore. It was really a cost driver at the end. And so we want to internalize the production of e-learning. But perhaps it was a little bit too early. It was not really successful. Um, after this area of rapid authoring tools, this learning experience uh, gains a little bit. We have seen, okay, there was a lot of e-learning, um, but the people don't consume them. We thinking about strategies, how we can gain the retention user and so better tools come on the market with more technology with more possibilities really great tools like like adobe or articulate or also imc so there were great tools um, where you can really create experiences out of it you don't need really for every product you don't need to to develop this with with highly uh, skilled people anymore um, but it was interesting with this demand of of this create tools and create functionalities, again, we, we raised up in a, in a situation where we need high skilled people in other direction, instructional design, for example, or um, people who have to use these authoring solutions and bringing every time to the next level. And mobile learning begins um, to gain more importance. Um, and then in 2015, 2018, um, all, always, before responsive training was a, was a term, but then we have more the peak of, of, um, of really usage uh, in responsive training. And there was an interesting um, discussion at this time I have seen, and this is the discussion between responsive training or responsive design and really responsive learning. What I mean is um, when you're talking about responsive design, at the end, it is only a design disc discussion. And I mean a visual design discussion. When you're talking about responsive training, you bring in the area of UX design. And this is a totally different view. Um, and when I mean responsive training, for example, then we had discussions like, um, do we need training? Again, or if somebody is um, on the train and wants to learn. Is the, is the training now responsive design for his mobile? Or perhaps he needs a podcast? He needs an audio. This is the idea of responsive training come up. Um, and then it was really for me the first time that we have think in a sensible way about the learner and we have bring it in the middle. But then we know it, COVID came. Um, and also before the digitization have an extremely strong volume push. So we, we had a rise of digital training. We want to pr produce more uh, and with COVID, a special situation comes in, cheap and fast. It have to be available quickly, extremely quick. It have to be there directly. Um, and with, with all the things we have built up, experience thinking, and we create the, 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 the next metaverse and all the things, this is there we, we gain, we come into a problem and this is time. Time to train is, is, is getting a value now before the value was more how, how sophisticated we can create training. Now the value is also time to train. And this is something um, where we have to, to see how we handle with these uh, things. The digitization rate is not a stop. Um, it is going up like, like before. Um, and a new point comes in, decentralization um, will be getting more importance. Um, but I will we'll go to this a little bit later. What we're seeing is that the first wave we had in e-learning was really developed from instructional designers and for instructional designers. Um, this this was was special. So we we every functionality such a, a software vendor like IMC have bring into such a tool is always begins in the head of an instructional designer. Um, and now with the with the raising up, we had and on mind shift we have to think in citizen developers and what i mean with this i will come later to it 
Um, so what does this change now we, uh, we see? So the main change we see and uh, we have to fill is, is filling the dynamical gap. So that means with the rising up um, of training amounts we have and the need, we have to fill this. This comes from a special situation. What you see here um, is the so-called uh, dilemma of adoption. Um, so we have a rising up technology. It's only the, the view on, on digitalization, not the more um, possibilities um, in, in manufacturing that we are more individualized or something else. So we had more need for training. And in the past, you see here technology rising up um, and you see the adoption rate of, of other areas like individuals, businesses and public policies. Um, so until the 1990s, 2000, it was possible to fill the gap with training and especially with um, with training, which was developed internally over or over an agency. So on a really high level. But now we are heading into a situation where we have, let me call it T2, so um, the former time view, um, where we cannot fill the gap anymore with our old paradigm. So we have to change this paradigm and this gap will be getting bigger, bigger and bigger. Um, we see it already in nearly every customer, especially bigger customers, they're working globally, um, they have a bigger gap. And this is another point I want to give you with why this gap is getting bigger. This has a little bit something to do with so-called composable architectures or composable enterprises. So companies are changing their approaches more into decentralizations. So we're seeing that global acting companies giving more autonomy into regions, countries, what else? Um, so that they have more possibilities in their area and um, they're cutting a little bit the headquarters away. So, and then in this point, you're raising up the decentralizations. Um, and this is something what also raise up the training area. And the need is then especially to, to fill this gap is to, to shorten to the time to train because besides the, the raising up digitalization area, we have on the other side uh, the point that the, um, the training times uh, needs to shorten up because we have too many changes in a too short frame. Um, when you're looking in the logistics problems in the last years, um, we have now the next crisis we see in the, in the Middle East. Um, and this will change it again. So um, when, we, when we're looking on, we cannot think anymore in processes running in two, three, five or 10 years. So we're changing our, our enterprises. And this is a, is a new um, time we're seeing. We change in our enterprises nearly every 12 months now. In the past, especially when I'm looking into our dinosaurs companies in Germany, um, they change in their companies every 10 years. And now they're going into 12 months. So the time to train have to be shortened. And um, there are different strategies we can go in. Um, I want to show you some, some content sourcing strategies. Um, and here are different types of so-called content sourcing strategies. Um, I have only some examples. This is not fully uh, built here, but we want to focus on one especially. And I want to give you some examples from other ones. So the, the one thing is learning curation. Um, we can call the book, can go over so-called standard content, off-the-shelf content. Um, we have agency-based content. So I externalize my uh, production of training, uh, my consulting of training. Um, I have an internal development department or I go to the direction of employee-generated training. Um, when we're looking at some parameters here, we can easily go through um, some ideas where we can go into which strategy. Um, when we, when we, let me start with the agency-based content because you see here mainly uh, three stars. At the end, you, you have nearly every possibility to go to a great learning experience designer, a great company, they're creating you the best learning experience you can imagine. Um, also, IMC is doing this and this is clearly this, everything is possible, but we also know this costs efforts, resources, and especially it costs time. Um, the agencies outside, they are not the subject matter experts. So they cannot bring directly the didactical approach on paper. They need the subject matter experts. They have to feel the company. They have to discuss about the target groups. So this needs time. Sure, there, there are more possibilities today. Also, when we're looking into artificial intelligence, for example, to make a target group analysis, but 
every company is different. That's the idea, the main idea behind why we make training. When, when not the companies are different, you can buy only off the shelf content. So this needs time and it costs money. That's clear. When we're jumping directly on young employee generated training, this is a little bit different. The development time is much more shorter. Um, and the, 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 what is also interesting is um, we are much more closer to the business. So subject matter experts perhaps are the idea of a bio employee generated training. And this is something what we want to focus now um, in the next couple of minutes. Um, employee generated learning or training, or you can say user generated content, which term, uh, what else? Um, it is not a new term um, and it's not a new idea. Sure, it raised up with the idea of um, the creator community. But already Gartner have um, prognotized, I think it was 2016, 17, that by 2018, more than 80% of the organizations will use user generated content. Um, and the interesting fact is, I believe that the number is much more higher, but we don't know that already a lot of training happens in the company um, on the user generated content side. Um, and the next interesting fact is when you don't know it, then this is the most successful training you can have in the company. Because when somebody is, is consuming at the end training and don't have the feeling that this is training, then he have the, the most value outcome uh, based on such trainings. That's an interesting fact we've seen um, as, um, by our customers currently that we have a lot of running grassroots training uh, principles and um, structures raising up um, and especially in the time of COVID this comes up that more and more departments um, are something like small L&D departments. But yeah, this is a little bit the other point, um, employee generated training. What this means um, for me, it's, I like the term of the, of the citizen developer. And this is also something um, I have given you this example with the web technology. Um, and I like to, to look on different technologies and to see trends. And I try always to map this in our field, in our learning field. Um, and when I map the web technology, I can go to the other side and can map uh, the IT side, really deep tech. What happens on the IT side? And the IT side have a big problem. They have no resources. They were not developers in the, uh, anymore in the world. So not enough developers to, to fulfill the needs we have. What happens? Um, there were companies like, like SAP, uh, like Software AG or something else. Um, they creating now tools where the businesses can create software on their own, so-called low codes. So you don't need a core developer anymore to create an application. You can create for your own business process in your department with the other software product you can create a piece of software and especially with generative AI, you can do it much more better in the future. And such developers are called a citizen developer. So in the businesses, they're sitting in the business, that's the idea behind citizen developer. And they're creating with low code software products, they're creating content. At the end, it is content. And it's the same in our um, area. And then we, we see that there is a small organizational structure change when we going into these employee generated training or we using our citizen developer. Um, and the interesting thing is we decentralize learning. In the past or the, the couple of years uh, ago, the idea was always to centralize everything. We have tried to, to cr have one learning management system. We have one database. We have one or two content providers. And we have tried over the L&D department to understand the whole company. A global acting company with a diverse product portfolio and a diverse service portfolio, at the end, it's not understandable, honestly. It is really hard to centralize learning and development. Um, and now the, the, the idea is to decentralize again. Or not again, we need to think about in a composable enterprise to take out some areas and put it in the business again. And this means we take the, the, the idea of um, content generation or also the learning processes and put this into the businesses. So they get, they're getting local executions. Um, and the special thing is um, the learning and development department 
we see this uh, now by, by a lot of customers, they are not anymore responsible for creating uh, training. They are not responsible for the demand management. They are only enablers. So they consult and they deliver the framework. And this is something where we see the, the biggest shift in learning and development that uh, acting more as an enabler instead of a service department um, only creating content and have the, the, the switch always between content and SME's uh, development uh, idea. So we're going more into the businesses and giving them more autonomy. And then the question comes up from our customers when we, when we have such a strategy and we, we're saying we can use, really use citizen developer to create training, um, is it, is it possible that we can hand over everything uh, to these departments? And um, it is easy to say, no, we have to analyze and now the demand comes in again. We have to analyze our, our training architecture, <laughs> our content architecture, so how our content house is looking. What is our, our things we, we have to deliver and which one we can hand over and we, by which one we can enable them to hand over them. Um, there are existing different um, strategies. Um, I like really easily a Boston Consulting Group uh, strategy where we're creating normally with our customers a matrix where we make an ABC analysis. Um, so for example, we uh, structure um, a training approach, uh, training demand into uh, the target groups, um, into the content complexity and especially into the relevance um, from, so at the end, how many, um, how, how many relevances it have for the whole workforce or for the whole company. This is really uh, now an, uh, an easy uh, picture. Normally this is much more complex when we're going into consultants phase uh, with our customers. But what it means is at the end, you see then you have a, have a square in the right left bottom side. Um, and this can be this user generated content, employee generated training area. And there, there will, will, be, is, will be getting interesting how big this is in, in your company and how many autonomy you can um, give up. So, and this is um, the point when we have started roughly four years ago with this mindset and we have seen that the market, market is changing. We have defined on our side, we, we need a solution for the market. We want to help the market. Um, and honestly, also to be opportunistic, we see there is a change and we have to, to deliver a solution. But on the other side, also, we believe in this change and we believe in this structure that this will stay also over years and years. You, you will have external agencies, you will have your internal production, but you will also have your user generated content side um, to really to deliver all the demands, uh, to fulfill all the demands you have. And yeah, at the end, this is something rather 80% and fast and 100% and slow, where we have to heed into, we have to understand that there was a market change, um, also an, an, a change in quality. Uh, it sounds hard, but with generative AI, for example, um, we, we don't believe anymore in 100 or 110%. We say 80% is okay, um, when it is much more faster. And this is also an approach which is new for the learning market, again, because we, we have come out of this instructional design approach, which always have a high quality approach, and now we're heating into 80%. That don't means this is bad. 80% can also be really good, especially when the value is time to train. So the time to train is short. Um, so what, what at the end, when you're going into employee generated uh, training approaches, what, what are your benefits? Um, the one thing is really that the businesses understand their businesses. Um, we, we as instructional designers are really great in transforming topics, ideas into great experiences. And they will be needed in the future. That's absolutely clear. Um, for, for example, especially for change and culture trainings and such things. Um, but when we're looking into product trainings, into um, yeah, competitive um, analyzers where I want to train my sales, et cetera, um, the people understand their people much more better. They, they know how they want to consume because they consume on the same way. Um, my most important thing is we can fostering the learning culture. So when we give people the power to produce content, 
they see that as that the, as a, their own learning culture. They starting and thinking and creating training, and then training will be getting more important. Sure, the, the productivity is um, extremely increased because you produce much more um, content than before, faster again. This is the same with Swatcher L and D's department's capacity. Um, this is something we're lacking a lot of people. Um, and the knowledge will be much more easier to retain uh, because you, you think in, in automatically in, in smaller um, modules, you think more in micro learning and in faster approaches. And this one is important. When we have started in thinking how we can give our customers a new solution, the, the first thing we have started with is reducing complexity, taking away everything you can imagine um, and be focused on reducing complexity. So this is our first paradigm. We have started to create um, a new user generated content tool. And this is IMC Express. Um, IMC Express, um, there are three points again which which we have clearly said it will be getting successful um, for our customers so they will getting successful with this tool um, based on three paradigms the one is decentralization so we have the clear focus on the target groups the citizen developer the citizen developer is our customer the citizen developer is our producer is our author is our user it is not an instructional designer this is an important point because we're going then in the in the right field and in a total different field. The simplification, reducing complexity, will be the main point to use training to create training. Without motivation, with a lot of steps, with a lot of enabling needed, you will, will be not getting successful in employee-generated training. And on the other side, we have think about how we can create a maximum support. Also, also when we have a simplificated tool, perhaps um, the people are a little bit avoiding to create training as the first time. I'm, I'm, I'm no trainer, I have no background. And there, this is interesting, there we come in with simplifying life through AI. So what can we do to help the users to, in, in every area in their creation field, to make them such as, much possible successful like uh, instructional de designer for example so to give them really the power to create highly engaging and experienced content and i want to give you um some some other success metrics how you can uh, create or how you can implement such an employee generated training approach the one thing is um we're facing a lot of prejudices so um this is something where you normally have a, to create a battle card. So we're creating with our customers, for example, a battle card. We're analyzing the possible target group and jumping in um, with, with, with different uh, arguments and also building up a strategy based on this. I will not uh, deeply this because we we, uh, we share the slides uh, at the end and you, you can have a look into this. What is more important is um, how we can find the right persons um, and how we measure the success. Um, and this is in an employee generated training approach, much more important, the, the, the measuring of the success than, than um, by a normal or uh, an existing learning, because we, we, we don't sure an existing learning on bespoke content, um, we also measuring the success, but here it is more um, measuring if the customer at the end, the learner, likes the idea of employee generated training. So he have consumed it and he can say, yeah, I believe in this training and this is another approach and I like this approach. Um, the other way of thinking is um, how we can help the employee generated, this is the framework idea, to, uh, how we can help the, um, the employee generated training people to create content, for example, on a regular basis, um, involve as much as possible departments. It's extremely important at the beginning to have a, a lot of motivated people um, to have a more like a multiplication approach so that uh, the people are speaking about this uh, a new idea um, and then they they infecting other ones also to creating such trainings. So when we're going into simplifying life, um, this is a little bit also the, from the session, the idea what what we are doing here in the AI field. Um, it was really the idea to really use what currently is possible um, and what is possible, what is workable, 
and usable for somebody who is not from the training field. There are easy things like, um, I jump into, we can recognize um, images and can create automatically keywords. Um, that sounds easy, it is a complex thing, but it's also a very helpful thing because we can connect uh, picture databases. Um, and the next step will be then that uh, such a tool which we have created with IMC Express is able to fill the content automatically because it makes a semantic analysis of the content. Um, and this is something what you already can use um, in, in today's AI world. Um, the next thing is translation. The translations are nearly perfect today um, and the translations happens in seconds. Uh, when you're thinking in the current e-learning production, how long you need uh, to give this to the agency to translate this over your translate agency and so on and so on. We're talking about weeks and now we're talking about seconds. Um, the, the interesting thing is we also um, have uh, something like like a possibility to to let the user not to change design. So the tool de de decides what you have to do. So this is also something where we're going in next step is the tool decides which didactical approach you have to do and give him some hints uh, to change, for example, his content to make it more engaging for the user. And now we come in um, to the next step. This is uh, now available. This is based on GPT, what we are doing here from the generative, generative AI side. Um, that sounds easy to uh, not so so uh, crazy with subtitles, but Amanda will perhaps show it uh, uh, in a couple of minutes in the presentation. For me, this is the most impressive thing. Um, I was uh, my first time at IMC in 2007. I was responsible to create subtitles for videos. This was a so we a pain in the ass. This was crazy. This was so many effort to create and synchronize uh, such things. And now we are talking about seconds. Um, and this is really, really good with the translation combination that we directly have translated the video in seconds. Um, we can create automatically questions. So we make an analyzing of the content. Um, GPT creates then some examples. Um, and I can decide if I want this or I want to change this. Um, we have to, the possibility to make summarizing so that we can say, hey, please make me an abstract for this training. Um, so I have put in all my content, um, I have created my training, and then the tool can automatically create a summarize for me. Um, we can also create in keywords, which is important to make a chapter structure. Um, and um, we can also um, continuing text. So that means I starting a text and um, the tool uh, recognizes in which topic, in which field you want to go into it. And then you can say, okay, I create an example for you. Or I can change already text in, a, in, an, in another text manner. So when I'm not a good text writer and I want to have a, a training in a more yeah, psych, uh, educated way, then I can, uh, the tool can rewrite my whole text without changing the sense of the, of the text. Um, yeah, audio automatically and so on and so on. I jump a little bit over because um, I want to hand over to Amanda. Here you see um, some uh, QR codes. Again, you will, will get in the slides later, but you can scan if you want now. The left side is a um, webinar from our side where you have a live discovery where you can look at the tool and the other side you can directly test the tool. Um, but yeah, we're going now into a little bit of live session, hands-on session that Amanda can show you, especially the AI fields in uh, such a tool. Thank, thank you, Sven. I, I hope everyone can hear me and um, really interesting questions in the chat. Um, so I just want to dive right in because there are so many tools out there on the market at the moment, and we hear so much about AI. How is it really going to benefit us? Um, how well does it work? Well, I hope I can give you a glimpse today of our tool, which we um, have spent a long time developing as long as AI has been developing. Um, but let me show you the benefits that Sven's already mentioned and what AI can really do at the moment, which could help either your content creation team or your um, citizen developers. So I'm going to jump right in. I hope you can see this. Um, this is the tool. I'm going to create a new project quickly from scratch. Um, let me do this. Create. Um, and it takes us into a project field. So whether I am a content creator or a, 
a marketing person, this is the screen I'll see. It's super simple and very looks very much like the tools we see and use in our everyday lives. And we've got lots of options to start creating our content. So text options, media options, the all important learner interactions. We have tools of importing content and some amazing AI capability. But I just wanted to go back to um, the main screen and show how fast uh, this tool really is and how fast tools out there on the market are. So Sven talked about you know, freeing up that time to train. So we've really focused on speed in this tool. And I want to show you if I, as a lowly marketing person, have created a piece of content, um, I would often do it in Word or PowerPoint. Here it is, a really simple document. And this is um, from a McKinsey article on digital transformation. So I've done this, but of course, I have no learning knowledge, no learning experience as a citizen developer. Where's the questions? Where's the interactivity? So let's show how IMC Express can do that for us. And we can literally drag and drop that into the tool. And the tool picks up that content, including the images. You have complete control over the content. We can amend it. But let me show you instantly how the tool creates that into some accessible learning. Um, we talked about design earlier, which is so important. And of course, if you're scaling your learning, letting other people do it, you don't want lots of different designs and different people's ideas. You want to keep it looking spot on with your corporate branding. You can do that within the tool. It will come with a theme. I have multiple themes. We automate 80% of that design work. We've applied that theme to the learning. So let's straight away preview it and see what this learning could look like from my very simple Word document. So here it is. Here's what it would look like on a desktop. And we could also show it on tablet or mobile. It's instantly responsive. Um, and we literally play that learning. You won't be able to. You won't be able to hear this right now, but we also have built into the tool an automatic text to speech engine. So they will auto automatically be audio generated and it's picked up um, all the, the images we had in that learning. But you see the design and the theme is automatically applied. So we'll jump back to the beginning. So that's amazing. I have create, created an accessible learning in seconds from a Word document. So it's great to think about in your content creation strategy how that could benefit your team or people outside of your expert team. Sven also mentioned the language translation, which for me is the mind blowing part of IMC Express. I'm based in London, but we have a global team. So my work here is created in English, but what if I have a global team or global learners? Um, I can literally add languages at a click. I have over 70 languages to choose from. I'm going to add French here um, and apply that to this learning. And we can see straight away the French document is translated. This is AI translation, so it's great to get a native speaker to um, check it. And that document will be translated both in the text and in the audio. And you can see it there, all in French. And the most exciting thing for me is the fact that the learner gets to choose which language they want to learn in. So if you have multiple languages in there, the learner can choose which one they want to learn in. So Sven also mentioned video subtitles. Uh, I know you can't see me right now, but unfortunately you're about to see me. So I'm going to switch back to English and I'm going to show you how we import a video into this document. And this is a video I did earlier. Let's drop it in. Might take a little while to pick up. Um, I literally filmed this in the office earlier. Um, there is audio and there are no subtitles and literally to generate the subtitles, I go into the video and the AI will generate it for me. So as you can see, even as a non-learning expert, 
I can generate really accessible content at speed. Um, just to quickly, because I know there's lots of questions in the chats, the AI, as you've seen, is very built in. You, you can't see it working, you just feel the benefits. But we also have AI, a more traditional form that you can see here, and that is things like the text transformation. I find I've been using ChatGPT since the, the day it launched, and I find sometimes the hardest thing with AI and ChatGPT is knowing what to ask it to achieve results. But here we've spoken to our customers and our content creators and come up with some of the options that we know are most important. Things like simplifying text. You can also expand the text if, you, if you're not writing a lot, which is never my problem. You can expand it. You can create different tones of voice, so funny or educational. I'm just going to show you here how fast it works. So I'll simplify this text and it will work away and it will give you the options to either ignore the suggestion or add the suggestion as, a, as an additional piece of content or replace the previous um, suggestion. So I'll just replace it. So we have an amazing piece of content. I'll show you again in a second what it looks like. But you'll say to me, so where are the learning elements? So as you saw earlier, we can add lots of learner interactions. And if you're an expert in your, in your team, you will know exactly what to do, which questions to add, where to add flip cards and hotspots. But if you're not an expert or you need to work at hyper speed, the AI within IMC Express can do this for you. And I'm just gonna show you a really simple, um, idea here. As Sven mentioned, we can create summaries with AI, key points, we can add quotes, we can create flip cards, but I'm just going to show you how fast these things work by adding a question. So it's going to scan the document and come up with a question for us with ChatGPT. It will also give us the right answer to that question. So really, if you're not a learning expert, you can take your knowledge and have it converted into a learning experience really quickly. So it's just working away. Hopefully it won't be too long. Here we go. Great question. This would have taken me a long time to think about what question to ask, what the right answers would be, and it's immediately done it for us. Absolutely mind blowing the speed of AI these days, and we really feel like we've put it in this tool in the right way. So I'm adding that question. And I could preview now, but I really would just want to quickly go and show you it's just as fast to be able to publish this content. So I'm just going to flick back to the home screen to hopefully give it time to publish it. So here, I won't uh, terrorize you with my video, but to publish it is just as fast. So we can now export this content, which five minutes ago was a Word document. We can publish it as a SCORM file, a SCORM files. We can publish, download HTML web files, and we could also instantly publish it as a website. And I'm going to show you how that's done through a demo link. And you can also get your mobile phones ready because I can publish this with a QR code, which I'm going to do now um, for you to share. So you, you can share things instantly. Um, the world is moving so fast and there are things we need to know about so fast. Um, and the pressures on training and the time to getting training to market are ever increasing. And, you know, everything about IMC Express is about speed and there's your QR code if you want to grab that. And I'm just going to open the link here too to show you. And here is our content available in English and French. Audio is there, video is there with the subtitles. So I hope you enjoyed that. I'm going to stop this video now and hand back to Sven and the team for your questions. Thanks very much. Wow. 
Thank you very much. Uh, that is quite an impressive technology. We've got a lot of questions. I've got quite a few on my own, but I will prioritize the one from the audience. Um, so um, whenever you're ready, wonderful. Thank you. Welcome back then, and Amanda. It's lovely to see you. We've got, as uh, Amanda said, a lot of questions, and we only have ooh, 11 minutes. Um, I will just take the question in the order that they've been rated by the participants. I think it is fair. It's a democratic way to tackle the, the challenge. The very first question is from Claire. She says, and somehow I was actually asking myself a similar question. Do you think there is sometimes too much focus on the technology or chasing the trend rather than ensuring the content is fit for purpose, measure and impactful? So how do we ensure that there is a clear objectives uh, to any of those um, of those learnings? Yeah, that's that's at the end what I meant with, with creating such a content architecture framework. Um, sure, we're seeing here one tool, and this is also the answer: is this tool um, able to create every training? No, um, and and also a job aid can be a great training purpose uh, tools. So, uh, so at the end, we um, I, I like this um, something perhaps somebody wants to uh, contact me over the platform, I can share this then. I like a, a project we have done with a, with a German company. Um, at the end, we have created 74 different learning formats. And we have bring them um, in a sensible way to the people um, with, with a little bit like a calculator um, to give them an idea which training format and which idea and also at which time and for which person you have to, to create. Um, it is not, and it's really important, it is not about the technology, um, but the technology in, in certain cases can be an enabler. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you very much then. Um, Amanda, anything to add? Thank you, Claire, for your questions. Um, I'm going to move on to uh, one uh, that uh, also I think echoes to quite a lot of us, which is from Naomi. And she said, how are people incentivized to create uh, content on top of their regular task? And I'm sure there's a lot of subject matters in organizations that's already flat out. And now we have to tell them, well, on top of everything, now you're going to work on learning. How is it received? Is there special cultures where it works better? Please tell us a little bit more. I I only give you one 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 hint here, and this is I don't answer the question. Sorry, but <laughs> I like this this approach. Um, take always your your hardest competitor in your company. <laughs> take somebody who who you absolutely believe you will not bring this person to training or to create training, because he is the loudest one or she is the loudest one. Um, and we we know that we cannot turn this person into a, a training producer. And then you have to change this person. And then all the other ones thinking, okay, when he or she is doing this, then everybody has to do this. Um, so this is an interesting culture approach um, I have seen by by one uh, uh, manufacturer, car, car manufacturer. Um, this is interesting. That's really an interesting point. But on the other side, to be honest. Um, you have to to give the people the, the time for for doing this. Yeah. Also, learning culture is an organizational thing. This have to be come from the from the management. The management have to be clear that we want to do this, um, and then you have to reserve time uh, for these things. Um, and when you don't do this and put this on on top, uh, this will be will be not getting successful. And have you seen some incentives to actually do it like beyond the culture, like some form of reward or acknowledgement of the work? Is it, you know, this kind of thing that, uh, that normally is conducive of results? We already seen, especially um, in, in so-called learning circles at customers, that they're creating uh, the incentives more in a way um, that you have the possibility to connect with, with different departments and to, to connect with different uh, persons in the company. Um, and then you have the possibility um, to go on a learning day or something else. So that is really that that everybody sees that this learning also have an impact on, on my my professional, but only on my um, connected life in the company. Um, but what I'm 
personally uh, see as uh, really as a possible and, and a positive thing. I see this a lot by micro example. So by such companies like Microsoft, they have really um, global learning days. They're putting down the whole company for one day and learning together. It's a little bit like learning hackathon. Um, this is something we're fostering the culture enormously. Fascinating. So absolutely, a learning cultures, developing and growing learning mindset is ideal in, you know, for this kind of user generated uh, content. And I've got, well, Steph, Stephen has asked a lot of, ver a lot of very good questions. Um, uh, but the top one so far is how do you effectively and efficiently moderate user generating training using a th th thorough Q QC and QA process, just quality mm. focusing on quality. I think you touch on it, Sven, um, in yeah. in your presentation, but maybe you can maybe give us a quick recap. Uh, there's not, there not an easy answer because it's really different uh, different from customer to customer. Um, at the end, it's also different what we see from from country to country, honestly. Um, okay. When we when we seeing when we looking into the Asia region, um, there there is the the idea of quality is is always one hundred ten percent. Um, and perhaps in other regions, and I don't want to name the countries now, um, eighty percent is enough, and they don't have this this quality uh, issue problems um, but yeah at the end um, there is a possibility from a technology side so we have it in our tool but mainly um, it happens in, in a learning management system that the people really have their own quality assurance approach um, and this but what, what as a trend this is more what I see is that the quality assurance comes more from an SME side instead from a learning and development side. So it goes not into a quality insurance in a didactical approach and is this the right corporate design or something else. Um, when we're going in this direction, we see that employee generated training um, is not so successful because then it needs too much time to roll out. Um, it is more that the quality insurance is that perhaps the supervisor make a proofread or something else. Brilliant. Thank you, Sven. I actually have a question that I'm going to branch out, but it's a little bit around that topic of quality is how is the content evaluated? So yeah. how is the content monitored, the usage of the content as well? Is there like system in places to say, oh, well, that that was, you know, what Stephen did was very good or Claire did very good or, you know, how how is it? How is it um, monitored? Yeah, so the, the best case, the best case um, when you want to measure these things is, but this is all also honestly the with the highest effort um, is to make A-B testing. Um, so you're, you're going into existing trainings and you split the target groups um, and you, you're looking at the end on the value, the results and the NPS. Normally you have an NPS score from the user, but with, with different training approaches. So highly effort into a high, big training, um, highly sophisticated, what else? And then you have an employee generated training. Um, and then you have normally when you have the possibility to go, go in such AB testings, you always have the same result. Sure. The employee generated training perhaps have not the highest NPS score. Um, but from when you when you're going into a Kirkpatrick model over time, and then you see it has the same impact like the train the other training, um, and then with not the highest MPS score, um, this is again we have to look in our content architecture how we can retain to gain the retention of the user with yeah other motivated trainings for example um this but this is now exploding the time a little bit but at the end a b testing would be the perfect way when we can do this um then we're seeing directly the differences between these both training types great thank you so much and actually branching out a little bit uh a questions from uh, liliana um who asked uh and i think it's a question that i've seen repeatedly uh through the different sessions so when we use ai um how do we monitor the copyright element of it and the validity of the content that is generated um do you have an answer within your tool um, how how do you police this element 
Um, so I have no answer now, but I have the answer tomorrow. So that's not really a discussion anymore because Microsoft uh, now offers with the Microsoft Azure services um, something like a closed job. Um, and also when they are ready, we're jumping directly on. At this point, the, 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 the content is in, uh, in uh, Microsoft Azure AI. Um, and uh, so in GPT and also GPT is learning on this, but this, this is really, a, a, I would say, a problem in, in a couple of weeks and not uh, in a couple of years. So this is uh, Microsoft already announced this, that we can go into such closed jobs and then we will use this also. It's a little bit like a caching. So at the end, we put in our data and uh, the model learns a short time and then throws the content away. So that's the idea. And this is something what we then also will use here. That but is... another point in the stretch of time, sorry, let me uh, say uh, one thing. Go for it. Another point that we're seeing, this will be getting interesting, that um, more and more customers are using their own models. So um, this is something where we also have to change our approach, that we have to jump into their, their existing models. So um, so bigger customers now tra make their, train their own uh, um, GPTs, for example. So this is then at the end something like offline GPT. Um, and they put this on their SharePoint or something else and ex uh, analyzing the existing materials in the company. And this will be getting extremely interesting because we have then the data from the company. Excellent. Amanda, would you like to add something? Sorry, I can see that um... no i was just agreeing and it just amazes me this the speed of ai and the Absolutely. development in technology um and as eagle said this morning in the first session uh we all at the beginning of it uh even some people speaks with more confidence about it i think we're all facing the same challenges and we can all learn from each other um actually um i'm branching out on a couple of comments and questions that um that 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 have come up um we're looking at collaboration um here and um and how do we uh how do we ensure that actually this thinking and i think that's a, a question from edwin and um, this thinking uh using subject matter expert within the organizations um bring bring up collaboration rather than uh, silos thinking and this is the this good question we, when we're looking into the first question. Is, is technology the answer? And um, it is mainly not. Um, it is mainly uh, frameworks and cultures. Um, and this should be also something where we should start, um, that we bring subject matter experts in new ideas of new learning formats. And learning formats, I don't mean now technology or e-learning ones. Um, it is really that they understand that they are uh, in, in an integral part of the learning culture and of the organizational culture. And we need them to, to push the company into the next level. Um, and this is something what you what you really need a framework for learning cultures. Um, a good good way what, what we, for example, offers all, always our customers or what we're helping them is going into a cohort learning approach. Um, because with cohort learning, you, you have really a highly interactive module um between different different people and can really integrate them on a low level this that's that's always successful thank you so much then and amanda thank you so much for um also our brilliant audience who asked so many very powerful questions uh you've been wonderful to work with uh, this afternoon unfortunately we are out of time and i think i've run a little bit which is frowned upon so my apology what do you expect from french share i don't know uh definitely not to run on time uh next session is next tuesday it's a uh, five example on how to um, um of how lnd can become embedded in the organizations and uh, no doubt it's going to be a brilliant session with nigel payne and Teresa rose so one not to miss it so tuesday 10 m AM UK time, 11 um, AM uh, European time. Once again, a huge thank you to you both, uh, Sven and Amanda. And um, please feel free to be in touch with uh, Sven and Amanda. Uh, you're going to find, I'm sure, your uh, LinkedIn contact uh, in on the page. If you have follow-up questions, um, the recording will be available tomorrow. And I believe we are also going to share a PDF of, this, of the slides uh, during the course of tomorrow or by Monday latest. And we're nearing the end of the week. Enjoy, uh, enjoy hopefully, a nice weekend very shortly.
Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Gail.